Hi, good evening everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, I'm doing very well, though I've had a crazy, crazy busy week and I have a feeling I'm going to have a lot of busy weeks between now and May because elections are, it seems, at least now, at least for the moment, elections are going ahead. So my schedule is going to be pretty full um, between now and May, but that's what it's all about. That's what politics is all about. That's what political parties is all about. Elections, winning elections, because the power is in those elected chambers, whether we like it or not. Um, I want to say, I actually want to say a couple of words this evening about something, to follow up on something I said on my live stream on Monday. And it's about secularism. I said on, on Monday that I'm a big fan of Marine Le Pen, which I am. And that I'm a big fan of France, which I am. And I've kind of, it's kind of been in, because I haven't, one of the things I said I admired about France was its secularism, and it is. And it's kind of been on my mind since then to talk about that a little bit more. Um, I was at one point, and in an, another lifetime, on the board of directors of the National Secular Society. And I, I, pretty much what I did was Islam related. So it was mostly about Sharia and the burqa and various different things. But I've noticed, and today I went onto their website and I've noticed there's a distinct, well, I'll take you through it in a second, tell you exactly what I mean. I didn't think it was like that then, and I'm not trying to be in any way malicious or spiteful or anything, it's just a genuine, honest observation. Um, let me just, let me show you what I mean. So I went through the National Secular Society's website today, and I went through their opinion section. And going down through it, you've got... Uh, Religious censorship is not about on is about ownership. Christian nationalism is a key part of Trump's legacy, so there's an anti-Trump opinion in there. Uh, our school and community were severely, severely disadvantaged by our CAB status. So you've got to you come down, and it's almost all criticism of Christian. Not solely. Um, to be fair, you've got a a Hinduism one here, Hindu nationalism. Uh, what they call Islamism in the same article, so religious censorship is about ownership. And that's that's one point. They always say Islamism uh, and not Islam. And it seems to me that that's the only religion that they try to protect by adding a political element to it. You know, if you're a secular society, your criticism should be of religion and not the sort of a political outpouring of the religion. And, and they do that with Islam, stick the ism on the end. And then you've got Christian, 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 something about Charlie Hebdo, so Islam related. Um, fairly, I mean, it's not wet or apologetic, but it's also not critical of the religion itself, which is what you'd expect from a from such a group. So we've got Christian again, Christian, 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 Christian. <laughs> oh no, wait, that's a, a discrimination in schools. Um, a school had rejected child because her mother isn't Jewish, so Jewish. Largely Christian, Christian, Christian. What about theocracy generally? Christian, Christian. religion in general, Christian, Islam, uh, the beheading of the teacher in France, religion generally, religion generally, Jehovah's Witnesses, interesting, Jehovah's Witnesses again, uh, and free expression uh, about the uh, Scottish hate crime bill. So it is mostly Christian, and you might argue that this is understandable in a, a majority, a, a Christian society, uh, a society which is historically, 
I, it's heritage, it's, a, it's Christian. Um, but I don't think that's the only reason. And I don't either think that if we're talking about dangers to our liberties, that Christians are necessarily the ones we need to be worried about. In fact, they're not. Um, there's very little about Islam in there. And it goes without saying that the biggest threat to Western civilization and and Christianity, of course, is a part of Western civilization. But the biggest threat to it and the freedoms that it has given us is Islam. That isn't identified, at least not in the way that it should be. So that's the kind of thing I mean. There's a real bias towards, or a real bias, a real emphasis against Christians throughout the, the website. And as I say, I didn't really notice that at the time I was there. Either it wasn't like that then so much, or I was different then. I don't know which one it is. But my departure came when I joined UKIP. And I did leave, to be fair. I, I But I jumped before I was pushed. Because I knew that the, the crucial issue of the importing of a religion to our society, which poses the greatest threat, certainly of religions, among religions, poses the greatest threat to freedom all over the world. And for us to import it via mass immigration into Western society is a really, really, really bad idea. And I knew that that would not go down well. Because when, as soon as you start talking about immigration, secularists forget or turn away from or deliberately will start to, to deride you to save their place in the mainstream, to not be dismissed as far right. And no one from that scene has spoken to me since, <laughs> genuinely. Um, they have, however, continued to work with and alongside and promote people who openly dismissed me as a racist and a fascist and all the rest of it. So there's a very strong message in that. Um, so that was when my time with the National Secular Society came to an end. But I have, in many ways, I mean, I started this by saying that I admire secularism in France, and I do, but it's not necessarily a secularism I would argue for in the UK. It's a part of France, it's very French, and it's wonderful for them. I'm not, I'm not asking for it in the UK. For example, I wouldn't disestablish the Church of England for a few reasons. Uh, one, because it is part of the history, heritage, identity, and has been fundamental to, and as is Christianity generally, fundamental to creating the freedoms that we have developed over the years. And to say otherwise is to deny reality. Christianity is... A Christian churches, and this is part of the reason why I... why I was passionate about secularism for so long. And perhaps part of it is personal because I grew up in Ireland and I saw, and I did see firsthand, the grip that the Catholic Church had and what it did with that power. You have horror stories. And to suggest that any other institution could have gotten away with that or could have, well, that's true, but not any other institution sets itself up as the moral judiciary in society. So when the church, which preaches morals and tells the rest of us how to live a moral life, when it does the things that the Catholic Church did in Ireland, it stings a bit. It's a little bit worse, I would say. And the things they did weren't minor. And they got away with it largely for so long, largely because of the power of the church and largely because 
It set itself up as and was accepted as a moral arbiter in society. So I still believe in freedom from religion. I believe in freedom of religion. But I also respect the heritage and history and identity of this country and believe strongly that needs to be protected. And that's why I wouldn't disestablish the Church of England. And I also don't have this enormous issue with bishops in the House of Lords because it's part of, you know, there are various different groups in society represented in the Lords. Why not Christians? And I also believe, based on evidence, that Christians have and are ridiculed, sidelined, and that their religious freedom has, in many ways, been restricted and tightened. Some of it justified, some of it very much not justified. Uh, and some of it an unfair encroachment upon the religious freedom of Christians. I think the religious freedom of all uh, people is trampled on with halal, but that's um, oh, not really a separate matter, actually. It is, it is, a, it is a, a, a Christian freedom matter, or a, a religious freedom matter. And it is, because if, if one religion, religion does not requ wish you to eat ritually slaughtered meat from another religion, but you're essentially forced to do, if you're talking about the public sector, schools, hospitals, um, there is an element of force in it, because it's a, if it's served as standard, and if you complain you're dismissed as an Islamophobe, there is an element of force there. So that is a religious freedom issue, and everyone but Muslims is having their religious freedom trampled on in order to accommodate Muslims. But one reason that I wouldn't disestablish the Church of England is because it would elevate other religions. And I don't want to see that happen. I certainly don't want to see mullahs in the House of Lords. This is what happen, which is what would happen if we disestablish the Church of England. Um, so there's just a couple of points I, I wanted to, to make on that, to, to follow up on it, really. Because it's uh, it's been on my mind since my live stream on Monday. Okay, so to a more light-hearted issue or um, point, I want to show you my latest and last for a while, I think, little one of these, and it's relevant because of what I'm going to talk to you about today. This is my latest, can't actually see it all, there's a very tall tower here, uh, uh, latest and last for a while, Lego City, this one's Tokyo, and I've, I think this is my, I think it's the most colourful, brightest one so far, and, and lovely to make, now I've never been to Tokyo, but it is one of these places that I desperately want to go to, um, God knows when I'll ever get to travel again, or any of us will ever get to travel again. But it's very much on my, my bucket list um, of places to go, and I do intend to go, because as I've been saying over the last couple of weeks, I've been doing a little bit of studying this, Japanese culture, which I'm really, really interested in and really fascinated by. So today, I've read the next chapter in this. I spoke about um, the, it was Ikigai, again, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing these things properly, but, but there you go. Uh, the next one, the one that I read today, and one of the reasons why I'm so interested in Japanese, why I like it, is things like this. It's Wabi Sabi. Now, it's maybe pronounced another way. Um, it's, I don't know whether it's Wabi Sabi or Wabi Sabi or whatever, but it's, um, it's basically a concept of seeing beauty in imperfect things. And that I like, because imperfection is, is reality, it's part of life, and nothing is perfect and no one is perfect. And I quite like the idea of looking for beauty in the imperfect. But it also is looking for or accepting 
the transience of life and that change is a part of life and that's true it is what we have to grab control of is what kind of change Be but change is we cannot sit still I mean, we would be still living in caves if we had sat still change is a part of life and again what's crucial is the kind of change and that's what we need to take control of and to make sure along with that change that we preserve the best of what's gone before us. Make sure you keep the good bits and make sure your changes are changes for the better. That we can control. What changes we make we can control. But the concept of change in life we can't. And there's a this, the concept of this of wabi sabi is to accept that the impermanence of things. But something else that's obviously a key part of it is acceptance. And I've so spoken about acceptance before. I find I, I watch it happen and I find it more I observe it all the time is people's struggle against things they cannot change. And I often think that if you rerouted <clears throat> if you rerouted that energy, the energy you spend struggling against <coughs> excuse me, not COVID. The energy you spend struggling against things you can't change would be much better spent doing things you can change or trying to change the things that you can change. So to give you an example from my own sort of political life, and this is often how I, I best understand things is when I apply them to my political life. I have to, there's nothing I can do, for example, about how the papers talk about me what my Wikipedia page says about me. I can't do anything about that. Now, you might be able to say you could sue, but A, I haven't got several hundred thousand pounds in my pocket. And B, we are in a society where I don't actually have the same rights as everyone else. I am at the very, very bottom of the ladder. And I would struggle even to get a lawyer, I would struggle to get a judge to give me a fair hearing. And because laws are so skewed towards this concept, this absurd, because it doesn't mean anything, concept of hate, I'm basically unpersoned. And I am very much not feeling sorry for myself with that. It is a huge, huge compliment to me because I know that what I say is true. And I know that throughout history, those who tell the truth are often vilified and often sidelined and often done person because people aren't, a lot of people aren't ready to hear it, don't want to hear it. And this is standard. This is standard throughout history. You'll see this. So I can either give all my mental energy railing against what's written about me on Wikipedia. It would be great to get it changed, but it's based upon press reports largely, and there's nothing I can do about them. And it's based upon things like groups like Hope Not Hate, and those groups are elevated in society, and that is the reality now. And I can't change that reality now. So I could be angry about it, I could let it drag me down, I could let it demotivate me, I could let it make me hopeless. Or I could use all the energy I would waste doing that and push it towards something I can actually do and something I can, a change I can achieve. And a change I can achieve is getting elected, getting into these chambers, where the powerful think, or so-called leaders think, that they own the place and that they don't need to consult people or they don't care about people. 
they care about their cushy little lives inside those chambers. So what I can do is get elected to one of those and then go on and work and strive to go on to change things. And yes, one person can change things. If I was in, you know, just honestly, let me in. Let me into one of these chambers. They're in for a shock. <clears throat> they would be in for a shock. A settled, established, comfy little status quo would be in for a shock. Because I'm not in this to be st part of the status quo. I'm in it to fight against the status quo because the status quo does not act in the interests of the British people. That I can do. And I need all my energy and all my optimism and all my determination to do that. So why spend it agonizing over the current reality, which is a biased press and a biased Wikipedia and all the rest of it? The best revenge I can have against a biased press is to win. And you win by working and going out there and being positive and believing it and, 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 and stri striving and being determined and persevering. And all of this stuff, all this other stuff, the rea today's reality, I want to, obviously the reason we go into politics is to change that reality so that in the future, the press won't be allowed to be so biased and we won't have this social media. If we fight back, but you have to get elected to fight back, but the point is, today's reality is, today on what are we, the 3rd of February, 2021, reality is that we have a biased press and a biased Wikipedia. I can agonize about that, or I can use all my energy to get my real, that's not my motivation, revenge against these, this bias is not my motivation. But success is the greatest revenge against any enemy. Anyone, if you have an enemy, don't spend your energy on them. Put your energy into your own life and succeeding in your own life. And to hell with them. So I like this this concept of Wabi Sabi. It is again just it's 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 so many things that I'm that I find really positive and inspirational in one concept. It also mentions the present moment that I I'm so um, I've spoken about <coughs> so many times. So okay, to finish, I will I'm going to go back to my. What is this called again? I always forget. Every single week I forget what this book is called. Words of Wisdom, Inspirational Quotes and Thoughts on Optimism. And this one is somewhat related to what I've just been talking about, which is acceptance of things you can't change. And there's the, the serenity prayer, which I love. God, what is it? God, grab me the... The courage to accept the things I cannot change. And the wisdom to know that, that, wait, what is it? Anyway, I'll remember it in a minute. But this, I want to read this to you. This is a quote from George Bernard Shaw. And it is related to this. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. There it is. Moment there. So this is slightly related to it. And it's a quote from George Bernard Shaw. It says, people are always blaming their circumstances for what they are. I don't believe in circumstances. The people who get on in the world are the people who get up and look for the circumstances they want. And if they can't find them, make them. And again, to me, my interpretation of that is the circumstances is the reality of the world around you the good and the bad, and it includes, the reality of the world around you includes things over which you have no control. To make your plan, to move forward, you have to accept this ground you're standing on now and go out and find and create your own life within it. And I can, the best example I can give is, is the one that I've already given. 
So I'll just read a bit uh, of what is said down below. C circumstances are overrated. We often use our circumstances as an excuse for not getting something, or even worse, not even trying. It is scientifically proven that our outside circumstances make up only 10% of our lives and happiness. Where we live, where we are from, and who we are with only have a small influence on what we make of our lives. So you have two choices. You can complain about your circumstances and not do anything, or you can go out and make your own circumstances. If you look at successful people, that's what they did, and you can do it too. Look to the people who are where you want to go, look at how they made their circumstances, and then do the same. I think another kind of example I might use for this is for people who come from a poorer background, for example, like myself, are to believe they can't do something or shouldn't try to do something remarkable because of where they came from. It's just sort of accept that only well-off people succeed uh, or you know go on go into powerful positions. It's an acceptance that we shouldn't accept. Your background doesn't have to determine where you go in life. And we shouldn't accept that. It kind of relates to what's to what's coming next. I, I, what I, I think a lot of people have, and largely based on background or money, is a feeling of those people, some people in parliament or people in government, are. I know, although a lot of people wouldn't articulate it like that, there's a, almost a, a, an ingrained feeling in their heads that somehow these people are superior. They are not. Just as people who have a certain kind of accent are not superior, they are where they are. Many of them, most of them, if we're talking about Parliament, they are where they are. Because they're part of a party machine, they're not. You know, a lot of a lot of people in in Parliament are particularly uninspiring. So the idea that they are somehow in, superior to a, a guy or a woman who works in a, in a factory or works in, they're not. They're not. And this feeling of yes, inferiority that a lot of people have stops them from realizing their own power realizing what they can achieve and going out there and trying to do it. And this is part of the reason that we end up with the principle-free riffraff that we have in Parliament, which doesn't give a damn about this country, is because the rest of us have sort of sat back and said, well, we, we better leave the power, the power to the powerful. Absolutely not. Realize your strength and go and take back your power. And there's a, the next quote that comes up is a fairly famous one from Eleanor Roosevelt, Remember, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. And to read on, it says, it often seems like the others are to blame if something happens or if we feel offended. They offend us, they made a remark, they are ridiculing us. But when we shift from the external to the internal, everything changes. What they say to us is one thing, how we respond is another. Being called an idiot can only offend you when you think deep inside that you are an idiot. If you know you're not, you may as well laugh it off. If you feel inferior to somebody else, it's because you allowed it. That's good news is you have the power not to feel inferior. It's up to you. No, you're not inferior to anyone on this planet. You are you. Remember this next time somebody, quote unquote, makes you feel inferior. Now, though that's quite specifically talking about someone attacking you personally, the same can be said, I think, for social and political level. The people in power, let me just be entirely clear about this. The people in power are not superior to the rest of us. They are not. In fact, I would say, certainly in terms of morals and decency and principle, they're vastly inferior to many of the people out here who aren't sitting in the higher corridors of power. And we really need to realise that. Okay, so I'll finish with one that's pretty different, but actually a nice one to leave on. Um, quite, uh, quite an inspirational one, actually. It's from Bishop Mel Wheatley. I don't, I must confess, know exactly who that is, but 
Face the worst, believe the best, do the most, leave the rest. This quote is a surefire strategy for living a good life in 15 words. Face the worst, it's an inevitable part that bad things happen to good people. So be prepared by knowing that overcoming our worst experiences often contains the seed of our most significant growth. Believe the best, believe that you'll make it, you can do it, good things are waiting for you. Do the most, do the best you can with what you are given at any moment. That's it, that's enough, not more, not less. Leave the rest, if you, if you adhere to the first three phrases of the saying, the fourth will fall into place. Things will happen and you can't change them, you can only accept them, leave the rest, you'll be fine. Actually, in that, there's a lot of, of what we're talking about, acceptance as well. Accepting things you can't change, focusing on the things you can, not getting dragged down by mistakes or failures. This is all human. And definitely not believing that to make a mistake or to experience a failure or to come from a certain background makes you inferior. It does not. We all have to believe in ourselves a little bit more. We all have to reroute our energies a little bit more to a more positive direction. And we all have to believe in ourselves a little bit more. That's the way we're going to take back our country. That's the way you're going to get your sanity back, your freedom back. That's it for me for this evening. I've got a lot of work still to do this evening. I'm got, actually, this evening I'm going to be answering emails. So if you're waiting for an email from me, there's a long list of them. And I do apologise, but it's, it has been a really busy week. Uh, I will, because we are hurtling rapidly towards elections, I'm going to reduce this video to fortnightly and my book review on Friday to fortnightly. Just give me a bit more time to focus on Hartlepool and Hartlepool related issues. Other things, of course, will carry on as normal. My live stream on Monday, my the work I'm doing on the manifesto, of course, is a priority uh, and general work of the party, of course, will continue as normal. Um, but I do have to reduce a couple of things uh, and I'll reduce these for this this and the book review for the time being all right thanks very much for joining me everyone i hope you're all doing well um oh i want to say just one more thing one more thing before i go i want to say to nigel and diane i mentioned a while ago that nigel and diane had sent me a fantastic gift and it really is a fantastic gift this wonderful photograph um which is I re it comes from, well, it's a related to, or uh, uh, they have a copy at the Imperial War Museum um, in London, which is this. I absolutely love this. And I just want to say to Nigel and Diane, first of all, thank you again. It's an absolutely wonderful gift. Um, but secondly, the reason it's not yet got pride of place behind me in my office is because I've struggled to find a frame for it. I, I don't know how this happened because I got my measuring tape and measured it because it's a slightly sh different shape. And I waited, I didn't have, there weren't many of this shape available. And I wait, I did, I ordered one. It took absolutely ages to arrive and that didn't fit. So that's the, I'm going to, I will find a frame as soon as possible. I'll make it a priority now, but that's the reason for that. And I'm sorry. Um, I will sort that out as soon as I can. Um, okay, guys, thanks for joining me. Um, look after yourselves. It's, I know this uh, times, times aren't easy, um, but do look after yourselves and uh, have a think, have a think about standing for election in May and we have the party has coming up this weekend a a conference and if you want to go for it if you want to go to it email conference at for uk activist conference to say how we are going to prepare for these elections and why they are so important but 
how to do it, how to campaign, how to stand, the support we will offer you. So if you're interested, and I hope you are interested, come along on Saturday. It's online, obviously, at two o'clock on Saturday. Um, and if you want to come, conference at forbritain.uk. Okay. Thanks a lot, everyone. Take care of yourselves. I'll see you on my live stream on Monday evening. See you then. Take care.